Good morning. I mean, evening. <laughs> Somewhere. <laughs> well, let's come together and uh, uh, dedicate this evening to our Father. Lord, we come into your house and we want to we want to recognize that we're here because of you and on so many levels and we thank you father for bringing us here tonight giving us this opportunity and we want to humble ourselves in your presence we want to worship you we want to hear from you we want to learn from you and we want to leave this place lord stronger than when we came in so we ask lord that you would take us and this time have your way here be our Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory.
taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you, I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. teaches us, encourages us, and strengthens us, Lord. We open our hearts to you tonight, Lord God. Teach us the things that you would want us to know, Lord God, as we open ourselves to you. And we want to thank you for our time of worship and praise and adoration, God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the book of Isaiah again. So if you have your Bibles, turn to me to the book of Isaiah 21, chapter 21. Every time I read my Bible, I expect God to teach or talk to me about something or teach me something. This morning I read in the book of Isaiah, no, I read in Isaiah a lot today, but I didn't read it this morning. I read the book of Proverbs this morning and the book of Acts. But every time I go in my Bible, I expect God to teach me something or show me something, and he does every single time. And I believe that God has you here tonight, for specifically we are in the book of Isaiah 21. This is the reason why God has you. 
we're not just going to study the Bible, although we're going to study the Bible. But notice what I said, we're not just going to study the Bible. We're going to let God see what he has us to know and, and let him talk to us. So, Isaiah 21, we are still in this section known as the burdens are the woes. These are prophecies or telling the future. You know, there's a lot of books written besides the Bible. The Quran was written. There are all different kinds of books. But how we know it's from God is really, does it say what it says and that will it happen? Has it happened? What it says is going to happen. The Bible is the only book that we know of that every single time it says something, the prophecy has been fulfilled. Isaiah is full of prophecies telling what's going to happen in the future. Tonight we're going to see that this first prophecy that we're going to talk about is one about this place called Babylon. The greatest power ever in the history of mankind. And it's going to talk about it 200 years before it happens. To me, the Bible is an amazing, amazing book. And God is the one who wrote it, and the God is the one who fulfilled it. So he speaks about things in this 21st chapter that are heavy prophecies and they're serious things. Now, in this chapter, we'll see three of the burdens that the Bible speaks about concerning different nations. Let's start in verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 1 to verse 21. The burden against the wilderness of the sea as the whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it comes from the desert, from a terrible land. You know, when we read the King James, we look at this and we think sometimes, I don't understand it. But everybody who was hearing this understood it exactly the way it was spoken. So we did have modern translations that do help us to understand a little better, and it, the translations, new, the new ones, they do speak it plainly. Now, let me read a different translation. The message came to me concerning Babylon. The desert by the sea. The disaster is roaring down on you from the desert like a whirlwind. So this prophecy, literally, again, foretelling the future, talks about this place called Babylon. Now, let me show you this a little bit about Babylon. Babylon was the first world power. It was headed by Nebuchadnezzar. It lasted for about, um, about 100 years. It was the most powerful nation in the history of the world. Now, people think America was, and America is a powerful nation. It is the most blessed nation in the world, but the leader, Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible speaks about that in the book of Daniel, that he was the head of gold. He was the most powerful leader in the history of the world and had the most powerful nation. They had many different countries that they controlled. And this is a nation that it's talking about. So it's not quite at this point when they're writing it. It's on top of the world. It's in control of everything. It's not there yet. It's going to come in another probably 15 to 20 years. This will happen. It hasn't happened. But what they're saying is, is that God is going to deal with Babylon, as you will see. And God's going to bring, it says here, from the desert, a whirlwind sweeping like the Negev. And we're going to see in a moment exactly what it talks about. It says about this terrible land is going to come. And it's talking about literally the Medes and the Persians will come and destroy. And again, if you know history at all, you know that it's the Medes and the Persians, we'll discuss, discuss those more in this moment, are the ones who came and literally destroyed Babylon. Now, 
everyone that knows this has, knows about the scripture at the time that it's being written when it is fulfilled is dead we have scriptures in the Bible that have been written by men such as Paul, such as John the Apostle such as Ezekiel that were written 3,000 years ago, some of them 2,000 years ago, that in our lifetime, we can see some of them being fulfilled right before our eyes. But I want you to imagine what it would be like. All of a sudden, you've been reading your Bible, you've been studying your Bible, and you were born at this time when the Medes and the Persians come over and take over Babylon, and you look and you see this war happening, or you hear of it, or you read of it, that this war comes and destroys the most powerful nation in the world, and you already know it's going to happen. That would be a mind blower. But there are many things that you do know already that are going to happen in the future. The Bible teaches them in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21. The Bible speaks about them in Revelations. And they should amaze us because they were prophesied thousands of years ago and they're being fulfilled before our own eyes. Now what should that do to us concerning our faith? I believe that this is the only book that God has written, and there is no other. I'm not talking about this specific Bible. <laughs> I'm talking about every Bible that you and I have. When I see the things happening that the, God, the Bible says is going to happen, that God says are going to happen, how it's going to be, you know what it does to me? It strengthens my faith in God and in the Word of God. It strengthens my faith in whatever else that God said is going to happen is going to happen. And I see so many things today that are being fulfilled that is prophesied many, many, many years ago, and we get to see, be part of it. So kind of stand amazed in what you're going to see. And don't be fearful, although we'll see in a moment that Isaiah becomes fearful because of what he sees. Now, he goes on, verse 2. A distressing vision is declared to me. The treacherous dealer deals treacherously, and the plunderer plunders. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, and his sights I have made to cease. So let me read a different translation. There's several different translations I'm going to read tonight. One of them is the New Living Bible. The other one is the NIV, the New American Standard. And of course, our regular one, if you do, is the New King James. This one says, I see a terrible vision. I see the betrayer betraying, the destroyer the destroying. Go ahead, you Elamites and Medes, and attack and lay siege, and I will make an end to all the groaning of Babylon. So he speaks of a vision that he sees. Let me share this with you before we go on and talk about that point. Not everything God shows you is going to excite you in the sense of bubble you up and fill you up with joy and everything, and although the Holy Spirit does that continually. But there are going to be some distressing things that God is going to show you concerning the future that is going to happen to this world and to people. The first time I ever read Revelations and the first time I ever read Daniel, especially Revelations, it scared me. I was ignorant in so many ways, and I still don't know all that I need to know. I'm still learning and still growing. But it scared the pants off me. Matthew chapter 24 did the same thing to me. I didn't understand, but and what I did understand, it was scary. But as I grew in God, I understood I was not part of that in the sense of I wouldn't be under those kind of judgments concerning God. There'd be a slew of other people that I knew that would be. 
So as you grow and you learn the scripture, you start feeling, as you're going to see in a moment, how Isaiah feels. But I just want to remind you that everything that God speaks to us doesn't mean that they're going to make you words that are going to bring you a happiness. They're going to bring you truth. They're going to bring you about the future. God's going to deal with lots of things. Matter of fact, all the things he's dealing with are nations that have literally walked away from God, went into idolatry. God has even put people on the throne. Nebuchadnezzar knew he was put on by God, and he knew God after what he went through. But God still had to judge them because of the choices they made and because of sin. Now, it says here that he will have a distressing vision, or he had one, a cruel, a severe it could be translated that one who dealt treacherously is repaid with treachery. They're going to be getting what they gave out or sowing what they're reaping. Sowing from what, or reaping what they sowed. Now, sometimes it's hard to do what God called us to do. To be obedient to what God has told us to do, especially if bad news, if it's bad news. It's easy to deliver good news, but when it's bad, we can procrastinate. How many of you have ever been spoken to God, by God, and God said, I want you to go tell somebody something? Or somebody has called you for advice, or for wisdom, or counsel. They trust what you say. And you know what you have to say, what the scripture teaches, you know, but it's not easy to say. Because sometimes it's harder to get it through us to that person because we block the way because of how we think. Sometimes we think they're going to get offended or we're going to lose them as friends or we don't know. And Isaiah has to tell them things that are not easy to tell, but he's going to be obedient to God. Notice what it also says here. All the sightings have ceased. In other words, all the sightings that Babylon has caused others to go through will be over. This world, including the Jewish captives in Babylon, there's three things you and I are going to face every day of our life. The world, I look at the world and I think, oh my gosh. It's like an old baseball that's been hit by a baseball bat and it's, all the threads are coming out. Have you ever seen it when the ball comes out of the cover and it just goes out and the strings all over? That's exactly how our world is. The second one we're going to be dealing with is our flesh, that old nature that always is a fight. Every day you wake up and you look at that guy and you think, or that girl, and you think, oh my gosh, not you again. But that's how you're going to, that's what you're going to have to deal with every single day. And then there's the devil and his hordes and his evil things. Sometimes we look at things and we think, how stupid can they be? when they're being ruled by the devil because every person that does not know God is ruled by the devil and belongs to the devil, then you recognize they can be real stupid because they belong to the devil and the devil is guiding them. But these are three things you're going to fight every day of your life until Jesus comes back. And then the fight is over from then on, period. And more or less, this is kind of what they're feeling like. They're going to be free from the control of the most powerful man in the world and his nation of Babylon. I want to read to you on the same thought, what Pastor Chuck says on this. He speaks of the response upon himself. So interestingly enough, 200 years before the event, 
when at this point in history, Media, Mida, was just a small tribe of Persia and known as Elam by its tribal name. Before Babylon has ever become the first major world empire, while well, Assyria was in the period of ascendancy historically, he prophesied the destruction of Babylon by a combination of Media and Persia. Now there is no way, absolutely no way, that any man in that day could foresee the two little tribal provinces of Media and Persia or even them become a major world power that would destroy the tremendous empire of Babylon. This, of course, is just another one of those what we call internal proofs of inspiration. These fulfilled prophecies are these predictions that are made that are so unlikely at the time that they are made and yet so completely fulfilled. Let's go to the next verse, verse three. Therefore my loins are filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold of me like the pangs of a woman in labor. I was distressed when I heard it, and I was dismayed when I saw it. Different translation, my stomach aches and burns with pain. Sharp pangs of horror are upon me, like the pangs of a woman give birth. I grow faint when I hear what God is planning. I am blinded and dismayed. When Isaiah sees what is going to happen, it physically affects him. It affects his stomach, his heart, and his mind. Remember what I've shared with you about why God is allowing this to happen. He's judging Babylon. Judgment has come to Babylon. And we'll see two more nations that God judges here in this chapter. But when we see judgment happen, it should affect us. And I was watching something the other day. It was a news article, and they were in, on the streets of San Francisco. And on the streets of San Francisco, they were going on with the camera down the street. And there was probably, I don't know how many, the streets were full of drug addicts. And some of them were just laying there. They weren't there. You would see on some of them the needles that just finished piercing their veins with, sitting right beside them, and they're out like a light. And it wasn't one, it wasn't 10, it wasn't 100. It was the whole streets all full of these kind of people. And I don't know what brought them there to that place. Some people say, well, it's their choice. And partly it is true, it is their choice. But I do know that I feel so sorry for them because I could have been in that place and so could have you. I know you might think, never me. Don't ever say never me. Only by God's grace that we're not where those people made. And yes, you made good choices by the grace of God. I know of a lot of people who have ended up dead, they're young in their age, because of overdose or because of suicide or because of different choices. But by God's grace, we got saved and saved us from those horrific things. So this judgment, and if that is God's judgment that we see on San Francisco streets, if it's a judgment of choices people made that are in our leadership, then we need to be careful that we still feel that pain, that sorrow for others. Now he goes on in verse four, and he continues with that same thought. My heart waved, wavered. Fearfulness frightened me. The night for which I longed, he turned into fear for me. 
Some people believe this is a picture of the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, on the night in which he was captured. If this is a picture of what was going on in Belshazzar's mind, it would certainly be correct. He was in the middle of having a huge party when something terrifying happened. Evidently, God's word really affected Isaiah big time. Verse 5, prepare the table, set a watch in the tower, eat and drink, arise, you princes, anoint the shield. Different translation, look, they're preparing for a great feast. They're spreading rugs for people to sit on. Everyone is eating and drinking quick. Grab your shield and prepare for battle. You're being attacked. Based on the very night that Babylon was conquered, King Belshar was so confident that his city's defenses would last. Let me tell you how big the walls were. They were 200 feet high, they say, and they were 80 feet wide, the walls around Babylon. So King Belshar believed that he was unconquerable. And so when the attack came from the Medes, Medes and the Persians, and literally, you know what they were doing? They were getting drunk and they were partying. I want you to turn with me for a minute to the book of Daniel, chapter 5. This is where the story's at. Daniel, chapter 5. I'll wait a second for you to get there. Verses 1 through 9. You guys there? Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to the thousands of his lord, and he drank wine before the thousands. Belshazzar, while he would taste at the wine, commanded to bring the golden, the golden and the silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, his concubine, might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, his concubine, drank in them. And they drank wine, praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, of stone. And the same hour came forth fingers of man's hand. And he rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of his hand that wrote, and the king's countenance was changed. Duh. <laughs> and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote against his other, and his knees started knocking together. The king cried aloud and brought to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was the king Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. So they anointed their shields and made them, because they were made out of leather, so that the arrows would bounce off of them and the, she the spears would bounce off of them. And their petrified because God is doing something against them. Let me read you the, the next few verses, verses 18 through 28, with the same thought in mind, the same story of what happened. O thou, verse 18, King, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would, be, he would slew, and whom he would be kept alive, and whom he would be set up, and whom he would be put down. 
When his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed of from his kingly throne. They took the glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until they knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over him whosoever he wills. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thyself in thy heart. Thou knowest all this, but thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of the house before thee. And thou hast thy, and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubine have drunken wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass, iron, wood, and stone which see not, nor hear not, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and who are still thy ways, hast thou not glorified. This was a part of the hand sent from him, and this is a writing written, and this is a writing that was written, Mini, Mini, Tikal, Eupharsa. This is the interpretation of the thing, Mini, God has numbered the kingdom and finished it. Tico, thou hast weighed the balance and art found wanting. Pyrrhus, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar knew better. He had known about what his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had been through. He knew better than to walk away from God, than to turn to serve other gods, but he did it anyway. Pretty heavy, huh? Then comes the judgment, and this is what it's talking about there. Verse 6, For thou hast the Lord said to me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he sees. And he saw a chariot, talking about the watchman, and a pair of horsemen, a chariot of donkeys, and a chariot of camels. And he listened earnestly with great care. And I'm going to do the second part, verse 7, in a different translation, New, Stand New American Standard. When he sees riders, horsemen in pair, a train of donkeys, a train of camels, let him play, pay close attention, very close. And he cried, A lion, my lord, I stand continually on a watchtower in the daytime. And I've sat at my post every night. Now this speaks of the faithfulness and the endurance of the watchman in doing his duty and warning the people. So we want to talk just about a few minutes about this position we call, or the Bible calls, a watchman. I believe that God today calls watchmen to pray, to watch, and to warn. I believe that everyone is called to do this for their families. They're also called to do this for the church. So, every one of us have children, our grandchildren. Every day we are to watch in the sense of praying for them. My oldest grandson, who is a good, just a good man, I believe he loves God. We've talked about God a lot. He goes to church and Right now, he's looking for a job. He's got his degree in business. He's got his uh, bachelor's. The door hasn't opened yet, but it will open. So I've been praying a lot for him to get a job, and I told him, just wait until God brings a job to you. God's going to bring it to you. So trust him. So right now, I'm praying in that area for my oldest grandson and for my other grandchildren. I pray for them on a regular basis. But that's part of being a watchman, that's part of being a watchwoman for my family, your, your family, or your wife. I pray for my wife every day, for my, my children, my grandchildren, for leaders in our body, in the church. That's what I do. And that's what I'm supposed to do. That's part of what I'm supposed to do. Now, The watchmen are also to warn and to pray and stay on the wall no matter what else happens. And they may even die on the wall or be killed on the wall 
because of the approaching enemy. But they are not supposed to be sleeping or partying in which that's what was happening during this attack on Babylon. God wants watchmen to be watchmen. No excuses. It is our job to warn. It is the people's job to listen. We will not be accountable for what we did not listen, what they did not listen to. We will only be accountable for what we warned or didn't warn. I believe, this is just my thoughts, we live in a time when we as Christians, not to scare people, but because we love people, to warn them. Let me share this story with you. This is by D.L. Moody. He makes this statement, I was in the north of England in 1881 when the fearful storm swept over the part of this country. A friend of mine who was a minister at Evanmouth had a great many of fishermen of the place in his congregation. It had been very stormy weather and the fishermen had been detained in the harbor for a week. One day, however, the sun shone out in the clear blue sky. It seemed as if the storm had pressed or passed away and the boats started out for the fishing ground. Forty-one boats left the harbor that day. Before they started, the harbor master hoisted the storm signal and he warned them of the coming tempest. He begged them not to go, but they disregarded his warning and, and away they went. They saw no signs of the coming storm. In a few hours, however, it swept down on the coast, and the very few of the fishermen returned. There were five or six men in each boat, and nearly all were lost in this dreadful gale. In the church of which my friend was pastor, I believe there were three male members left. Those men were ushered into eternity because they did not heed the warning. I lift up the storm signal now and I warn you to escape from the coming judgment. I believe that God has chosen you to be alive at this very specific time, you and me. And there's a great possibility we are going to see the return of Jesus in our lifetime. But I also believe there's a great possibility we're going to see things happen concerning where we live in this world. That we're going to see many things that used to be stable pillars in our nation that are going to crumble. And that can be so many things that you already know that God has already shown you. And God says, I want you to warn people that you love. Let me read another story to you. And it's on warning again, being warned. In 1969, past Christian, Mississippi, a brief of people preparing to have a hurricane party in the face of a storm named Camellia. Were they ignorant of the dangers? Did they have been overconfident? Did they let their egos and their pride influence their decisions? We will never know. But we do know that in the wind was howling outside the Porsche Rishi apartments when police chief Jerry Petrina pulled up something after the, sometime after dark. Facing the beach less than 250 feet from the surf, the apartments were directly in the line of danger. A man with a drink in his hand came out to the second floor balcony and waved. Petra yelled up, you all need to clear out of this place quickly, as, as fast as you can. The storm's getting worse, but as they, others joined the man on the balcony, they just laughed and Petra ordered to leave. This is my land. One of them yelled back, if you want me up, you're going to have to arrest me. Petra 
didn't arrest anyone, but he wasn't able to persuade them to leave either. He wrote down the names of the next of kin of the 20 or so people who gathered there to party through the storm. They laughed as he took their names. They had, warned, they had been warned, but they had no intention of leaving. It was 10.15 when the front wall of the storm came ashore. Scientists clocked Camille's winds speed at more than 205 miles per hour, the strongest on record. Raindrops hit with the force of bullets and waves off the golf course created between 22 and 28 feet high. News reports later showed that the worst damage came to the little set settlement of hotels. The go-go bars, a gambling house known as the Past Christian Mississippi, where it was some 20 people were killed at a hurricane party. In Rocho Apartments, nothing was left of the three-story structure but the foundation, and the only survivor was a five-year-old boy found clinging to a mattress the following day. They wouldn't heed the warning. So tonight I want to warn you, and I know you know this already, that we live in evil, evil, evil times. Temptation is at an all-time high. Your phones, your computers, your TVs are places where you can be tempted and your children can be tempted and your grandchildren like never before. And there are many Christians today who are falling like flies and it doesn't even seem to affect them. Some have the attitude of whatever. If there's ever been a time, we as Christians, that we need to be in the Word of God more than ever, it is now. We need to be on our knees if we need to repent. We need to be standing in the shadows of the Almighty. I believe it is going to get worse before it gets better. We need to do whatever God's taught us in His Word and trust God with the rest. So we need to get ready. I want to read one more scripture to you, and I want you to turn there with me. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. I said to you earlier, I believe that the Lord's going to come in our lifetime, and I want to read a scripture to you that kind of verifies that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says this, By the time and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as a travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or we sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Let's go to verse 9. And look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horses, and he answered, and he said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. On all the called images, his, her gods, has broken to the ground. Oh, my threshing and the grain of my floor, that which I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
I have declared to you. So Isaiah is declaring, what I've heard from God, I've declared unto you. I saw this guy coming and he was crying. Babylon has fallen and has fallen. Of course, this reminds us of over in the book of Revelation, when the destruction of the spiritual and commercial Babylon takes place. Read of these angels that declare Babylon has fallen and has fallen. That great religious system that causes people to commit spiritual fornication, idolatry, and so forth, it's going to happen. This is a double prophecy, then and in the future. And so one little aspect, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, has a twofold fulfillment. At the fall of the time of the Medo-Persian invasion, but then also in the future as it was picked up by the angel in Revelation. Notice what it says here, and all of the carved images of her gods are broken. Babylon was really famous for false gods. They had so many gods. It was almost like Egypt, their gods. So the, the Medes and the Persians went in there and took their gods and crushed them and didn't understand why they had so many gods. Now, when they say gods, it's a small g, it's not a big g, it's not like our gods. It's they have a God, we have a God, they're all gods. It doesn't mean that. When they say gods, they mean idols. And the Bible speaks in the New Testament about what are behind idols. So when somebody worships an idol and they have six arms, okay, three on each side, like I believe the Buddhists, not the Buddhists, the... Um, Hindu, the Hindus. They're talking, in, and the Bible teaches that behind them is a demonic being that incites people to believe and to worship because they want worship just like the devil does. So behind every false god, there is a demonic force that is being worshipped or praised or adored. And even sometimes they can answer a prayer, so to say, because they're there and they're capable. But this is what was happening concerning idols. And so when we look at an idol, we look at things like that and we think that's an idol. We watch a movie on Exodus and Moses and we see all those idols. But the Bible teaches that there are idols that are different than may, maybe you think are idols. Let me share a few with you that are more than idols that maybe you don't even realize you idolize. Don't raise your hand, but how many could do with it? How many can with, withheld yourself from your phone? I see people that are, I'm amazed. And this is not, first of all, my phone, I have a phone. You can still call this a phone, I have. My wife has two phones, they say, her phone and my phone. And so I never use my phone except when somebody texts me, which I don't carry my phone, I have to come home. I'm not addicted to my phone, I could care less if I had a phone. But I went to the restaurant the other day with my wife and there were couples almost at every single table we're doing this. Or they put, they put their phone back in their pocket and for a few minutes later they pull it back out. They didn't even have a conversation with the person they're with. And that's what I call being addicted and that's what I call somewhat maybe being an idol. So idols can take on different forms. They can be TV where people all they do is watch TV all the time, nothing else. Most important thing is TV. It can be a computer, it can be Facebook, it can be a game that is played. You know, I want to emphasize this again. It can be sports. Uh, let me share something about this thing called sports. I love sports. My kids grew up playing basketball, football, I did too, and I love sports. 
But you think about this, how many hours you put in concerning sports. If your kid plays football at the high school, every single day after school, Monday through Friday, their time is taken up. Agreed? That goes on for probably 12 weeks. That's a lot of hours. And so they think about it, the whole time is about football, 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 football. Then they decide they're going to go out for wrestling. Nothing wrong with going out for sports. I'm going to say right now, they help you, teach you how to have teamwork. They teach you about just a lot of good things they have in there. But then the next sport would be wrestling. The next sport would be basketball in line. And most kids play two or three sports. If they had tiddlywinks, they'd probably play those too because they wanted to get out of the house and they're bored. But I want you to think of the hours that are consumed and then multiply that if a kid starts playing baseball at six years old until he gets in high school. If he plays in college, that's a job. They do that eight to 10 hours a day, those college players. So how many hours do you think that takes and consumes of a child's life? And then look at the percentage of them going any further than high school or maybe if they're really good, college. It's one in, I don't know how many million, the chances of that happening. And all the time they're worshiping the sport usually. And then what happens to them? They think everything about life is about sports. And they begin to, like their parents, idolize sports. And they miss God's time. And I, like I shared Sunday, the greatest thing I can do for my children is teach them to walk with God. When my children played sports, they could not play on Wednesday night. They played on the regular nights if they played sports. They didn't play on Sunday. They couldn't go play at a game if they had a game. I don't care where it was. They couldn't play any sports. They were here on Sunday and Wednesday, period. Oh, you're kind of legalistic, Pastor. No. I want my kids to know what the Bible, and you may get their priorities. As they grow up, they'll have a priority. God is first. The sports are second, third, fourth. Whatever it may be, that comes after God. And nothing is before God. So we need to be careful of idolatry in the sense of they're not a statue with six arms. And what's behind them many times? So they went in there and they destroyed all of these gods of Babylon. Let me share this story with you because it touched me when I read it. And again, it's about idolatry. It's called the wounded healer. Henry Nguyen retells a tale from ancient India. Four royal brothers decided each to be a master or to master a special ability. Time went by and the brothers met to reveal what they had learned. I have mastered a science, said the first, by which I can take but a bone of some creature and create a flesh that goes with it. I, said the second, know how to grow the creature's skin and hair if there is a flesh on its bones. The third said, I am able to create its limbs if I have flesh and skin and the hair. And I, concluded the fourth, know how to give life to that creature if it forms is complete. Thereupon the brothers went into the jungle to find a bone so they could demo demonstrate their specialities. As fate would have it, the bone they found was a lion. One added flesh to the bone, a second grew hide and hair, the third completed it with matching limbs, and the fourth gave the lion life. Shaking its mane, the furious beast arose and jumped on its creators. He killed them all and vanished contently into the jungle. We too have the capacity to create what can devour us. Goals and dreams can consume us. 
possessions and property can turn and destroy us unless we first seek God's kingdom and his righteousness and allow him to read into what we make of life. Amen? Verse 11, and Rama's son. The burden against Duma, which is Edom, or from the Edomites, from Esau. He calls me on to, out to see a watchman. What, the, what of the night? A watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning comes and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire, return, and come back. So the people of Edom are asking when the night is going to be over. With all the conflicts and the wars going on between Egypt and Assyria, Edom along with Judah was part of the air caught in the middle. They want it to be over. I don't blame them. But the morning will come for the Jews, but not for the Edomites. Verse 13, and the burden against Arabia. In the forest of Arabia, you will lodge your traveling companions of the Dinites. The Dinites were the tribes of, of Dedan, which was part of Arabia. O inhabitants of the land of Tima, bring water to him who is thirsty, but the bread they meet him who fled. For they fled from the swords, from the drawn swords, from the bent bow, and from the distress of war. For thus says the Lord has said to me, Within a year, according to the year of a hired man, already the glory of Kedar will fail, and the remainder of the number of the archers of the men of the people of Kedar will be diminished, what the Lord God of Israel has spoken in. So within a year, the Bible says here that this is going to happen to Kedar, to Saudi Arabia, they would be taken and be destroyed. In 716 BC, this happened and was done by Sargon. They conquered Saudi Arabia. We're going to stop there tonight. Let's pray and then we'll see if we have any questions tonight. Lord, I want to thank you for the word tonight, Lord God. And thy word is always a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord God. And Father, I know that you this, this evening spoke to us about warnings, God, about being warned ourselves, first of all, Lord God. May we take, it, take heed to, Father, anything that you would have us to know or anything you would have us to do, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that we, if need be, would warn others, God. I pray also, God, they would be serious about, Father, being watchmen. For each of us are watchmen in our family, and there are watchmen even in the church, God. Me being one of them, Lord. Father, may we, like they prayed, Lord, the apostles in the book of Acts, chapter 5, for boldness, Lord, with love mixed together, Lord, with mercy and grace, God. Father, may we stand where you call us to stand. And be who you call us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen.